So if you had told me five years ago that I would be standing here talking about being a drag queen, I would have not believed you. But like many stories, mine starts with a chance meeting. In my case, it was meeting Patty, and Patty was a drag queen. And she introduced me to the idea and the um, art of drag, a diva drag, which is the art of drag performed by women. And then promptly spent the next four years trying to convince me to be a drag queen. <laughs> so in the spring of 2017, I finally got the chance. Before I go into that story, I want to try and explain what drag is. It is hard to explain, and if there's any drag performers out there listening, I apologize in advance for missing something. Drag is art. It's performance. It's over-the-top makeup. It's big gestures and small details and wigs and costumes and sometimes dancing. And it's not all RuPaul's Drag Race, and every queen is so different. So back to the back to my first performance. It was for a benefit show, and I don't remember what my makeup looked like. I don't remember what my hair looked like. I do remember that it was this incredible rush to create this character that wasn't me and to go out on stage in so much makeup and in so many sequins that my partner didn't recognize me. And I clumsily danced around the dance floor in my little two-inch kitten heels, because that's all I can do. <laughs> and I lip-synced to a slightly off-color song, and it was amazing. It was the most amazing experience of my life. But I knew that that first show was going to be my last, because I had a secret. I was going to kill myself. I had a plan, and I had a timeline, and I knew how and when and where, and the why doesn't matter to the story. What matters is that my family figured out I needed help, and I spent a week in an inpatient psychiatric hospital. And I came out the other side with a timid smile on my face and a brain that was starting to heal, and these raw emotions, and the correct diagnosis of bipolar too. Anyway, that's me as candy to this first time. Bipolar two, really hard to explain. I'm gonna use really simple explanations. Both halves of my brain are in the car. One's just fine if we drive right off the cliff. And that's why for all the years I was depressed, nothing helped. The medication didn't help. I never knew what it was like to not be anxious every minute of every day. So after that appointment, I had my first appointment with a therapist. And I had no idea how I was gonna to explain to this guy how raw I felt. It felt like there had been a scab on my brain, and that scab let me be fearless and confident and go get stuff done and happy and let me function. And now it was gone, and I had no idea how to explain to him how lost I felt. Apparently, therapists are trained to help you with that. <laughs> I don't, again, I don't remember much of what we talked about, but I remember at one point, he's scribbling notes, and he looks at me and says, what do you look forward to? What makes you happy? Politics, I said. No, no. <laughs> What makes you get up in the morning and look forward to stuff? And you can't say your kids and family. It's totally gonna say my kids and family. <laughs> so I sat there for what felt like forever, and I thought, and I thought, and I remembered being so empowered, being candy cakes for the first time. And so I blurted out, I wanna do another drag show. And he kind of looks up and cocks his head to one side and goes, tell me more about that. So I did, so I told him how incredible it was and how I turned myself into a different person and I could go out and just dance for people I didn't know. And he said, do that more. <laughs> so right after that, I had been ignoring some physical symptoms on account of the being suicidal and not wanting to deal with anything. So I went to my medical doctor and I walked away from those appointments with a diagnosis of advanced rheumatoid arthritis and interstitial lung disease, as I promised, super simple definitions. 
everything hurts, I'm tired. Interstitial lung disease, don't Google it. <laughs> Sorry about your lungs. So, <laughs> so in the space of about a month, I'd been handed these three really significantly huge invisible illnesses that eventually let me, that made me quit my job. But still, I thought about drag. And there were times that summer when I was so tired and I hurt so much that all I could do was just curl up in my recliner. And so I did what any drag queen of the digital age does. I started watching YouTube videos. And I'd learn how to contour, and I'd learn how to put on fake eyelashes, and I would watch different shows, and my tiny dog kept me company. <laughs> She's gonna be a drag queen too someday. I wasn't doing shows, but I had something to look forward to. And so doing makeup became part of my weekly routine. I'd do makeup and then a shower seemed logical and then I'm dressed for the first time in a week. It was amazing. So in September of 2016, I got my chance to do my first real show. And again, I don't remember what I wore, don't remember my makeup. What I do remember is that the crowd didn't care that I was fat. They didn't care that I was wearing flats. They didn't care that I couldn't dance. They cared that I was there to make a connection with them and to entertain them. And the more I did shows, the more I realized I could do it. And that was such a huge thing. A friend of mine once told me to follow your bliss. Find something that gives you bliss and follow it. And turns out drag was part of my bliss. So with the encouragement of my now drag mom, Lady Cakes Monroe, I tried out for a local nightclub's Next Top Diva contest, knowing that I would not get in, but I got in. And I was one of 14 contestants, and every month we had a new challenge. So I had something else to look forward to. I had costumes to make, I had songs to rehearse, and it was incredible. I learned how to do age makeup. Well, at first I dressed up like Donald Trump because <laughs> reasons. I learned how to do age makeup. I wore a dress made mostly of candy wrappers. I dyed my wedding dress pink and helped my drag mom compete for a national title. I wore a nude cat suit that left nothing to the imagination while four of my best friends poured 10 gallons of Caro syrup over me. I was getting out of the house and out of my comfort zone. And that part is so important. Mental illness lies to us and says that the world is too big and scary and that we're not enough and it's somehow selfish to have fun and we should just stay home. Drag gave me an excuse to go have fun and it quieted the lies that Bipolar 2 told me that I wasn't good enough and I wasn't smart enough and I wasn't strong enough. And I went out there and I did it and I left it all on the stage. So here's what drag has taught me. I've been overweight my entire life. I love my curves, but drag queens do not care if you are fat. There has never been a you look fat in that. I have worn dresses that show my stomach and skirts shorter than I ever thought I'd wear. They don't mind that I can't dance. I will never ever be able to twerk, <laughs> no matter how many lessons I get backstage, and that's fine. Drag has encouraged me to be more colorful than I already am, and I have embraced the drag um, motto that you can never have too many rhinestones. <laughs> drag has reminded me that performance is something that I missed, and that you can never have too much glue or safety pins. Drag has showed me that despite my illnesses, I am capable and stronger than I ever thought I was. It's transformative and magic, and I am made of grit and determination, and I am stronger than the world tells me I am. Drag has also told me that sometimes you could adapt drag makeup for everyday looks. <laughs> Wanna wear glittery eyeshadow to a Christmas party? I'll show you how. Fake eyelashes are the most incredible thing until you step out into a windstorm in Ohio. <laughs> and then it feels like you're going to fly away. <laughs> but you know what? If you're having a bad day, slap them on, go to the grocery store, feel better. 
So I often wonder, you know, how people think of me. What do they see when they look at me? I'm a mom, I'm an activist, I'm an overweight woman with bipolar disorder and invisible illnesses. And drag has shown me that all these facets have been inside myself for so long. And becoming candy cakes has given me permission to be this happy person that can go out and talk to people and perform so far out of my comfort zone. Drag has become my bliss. And my story could have ended in spring of 2012 or could have ended when I didn't want to wear the tight dress or I had to take the heels off because my feet hurt or when I decided that I couldn't dance and so I wasn't going to do a show or it could have ended the first time I was so tired that I had to cancel a show. But every time I was brave enough to say yes, the world got a little brighter. So say yes. Surprise yourself. Drag is obviously not a cure-all for everyone with mental illness, but it's the thing that brought me out of a very, very dark place. It's also not a cure-all with everyone with RA, because <laughs> of the heels, um, but it is something that helped me and encouraged me to get stronger. You all might have not have found your bliss yet, it could be raising goats, or painting miniature figurines, or rhythm gymnastics, or stamp collecting, but whatever it is, it's out there waiting for you. So don't be afraid to go out and find it. I hope my story helps you find your bliss with or without the rhinestones. Yeah.